Um, I want to welcome you to our session on transitioning women's health from um, treatment to prevention. So I, my name is Nicole Althaus, and I have the distinct pleasure to represent the ECH Alliance as a U.S. ambassador. Um, so I'll be your, your moderator today, and uh, we'll just kind of go as we as the, as the discussion takes us, but I, I have some things prepared. Um, I'd like to first introduce our panel, and um, do we have Rachel online? Is Rachel online that we can show? Okay, great. I'm gonna start, I'll start, um, introduce, and then we'll set the stage, and then we'll start with our questions, okay? So um, I'd like to introduce Anuradha Gupta, um, she's a global leader, passionate about gender and equity and transforming health outcomes for women and young girls. While leading India's national health mission, the world's largest public health program, she spearheaded several initiative and large scale initiatives that led to a steep decline in maternal and child mortality. As deputy CEO of Gavi, she brought a laser focus on adolescent girls and HPV vaccination. In her present role as president of global immunization at the Sabin Vaccine Institute, she set up a global HPV consortium to accelerate the fight against cervical cancer and adopting a transdisciplinary integrated approach. So thank you for joining us. Um, and then I have Aisha, Dr. Aisha Brooks. Um, she is the Senior Health Policy Administrator with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and Immigration and Customs Enforcement Health Services Corps. That's a lot. <laughs> um, and it's wonderful. Um, a healthcare system that delivers medical, dental, and mental health services, along with public health and disease prevention programs to over 118,000 non-citizens housed at 19 facilities nationwide. Dr. Brooks previously served as an assistant surgeon general and the chief nurse officer in the US Public Health Service, advising on, on public health, nursing practice, and international health policy. With 28 years of nursing experience, Dr. Brooks has held diverse roles, including clinician, educator, and emergency manager, and is a consummate advocate for nurses, the nursing profession, and public health. And then online, we have Rachel Sturk. Dr. Rachel Sturk joined the Fogarty International Center in 2006 and currently serves as Deputy Director and Senior Scientist in the Division of International Science Policy, Planning and Evaluation and the Center for Global Health Studies at the Fogarty International Center at NIH. In this role, she oversees a portfolio of global implementation science projects and the program evaluation um, portfolio for Fogarty. Dr. Sirk's work in implementation science includes a focus on building research capacity in implementation science in low and middle income countries and using innovative platforms to build, bring, excuse me, bring innovation implementation scientists together with decision makers and program implementers across the world. Dr. Sturkey has worked extensively in India, Ecuador, Peru, and Sub-Saharan Africa and reproductive and women health initiatives. Okay, we have a great panel here. Great, great background, right? Boy, got through it. Okay, we're good. Okay, so I'm going to Switch to our slide. Have, are we not showing our slides? Oh, we didn't have it. So anyway, um, I'm just going to tell you about a few things. So we heard some statistics. You've heard a lot of statistics. I think what what maybe is not um, refreshing is that it's the same statistics that, that keep evolving and. And similar to what uh, Brian O'Connor was talking about earlier, we need to find solutions. So instead of just treating women when they're sick, let's look at whole person care. Why don't we look at more proactive care so that we can impact all the generations before the onset of, of disease and, and really help the pillars of our community. We talked about that last year 
as women are the pillars of our community because we take on a lot of different things. And so looking at um, women as a preventive measure is, is much better. Um, a couple of things that I was going to touch base on is just access of access to care is still a global challenge. You know, half of the world's population cannot obtain essential health services. Um, we know that there's a lot of misdiagnosis still going on in women's health. Uh, you know, especially even we're going to talk a little bit about cervical cancer today. 350,000 women die annually from cervical cancer. That could, that's preventable. Um, and then, you know, there's other areas like maternal health. We, you'll hear about that today as well. Um, but really what we're trying to look at is how can we be more proactive and how we, we capture or tackle these challenges. So I'm going to kick off finally and stop talking. Um, I'm going to kick this off with, let's put Rachel back on. Did I, there she is. Um, I'm going to have her start out first. So um, Rachel, could you just please add your, your insights, but I'd like you to pick one call to action. We're going to do this a little backwards. Typically, you do a call to action at the end. We're going to start the call to action at the beginning. So I'm going to ask uh, Rachel to start, and then I'll go down the line. Great. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's an honor to, to talk to you about the cause that is, is cru crucial to the well-being of women and girls around the world. Um, advancing women's health prevention, particularly in low and middle income countries. Um, just as a matter of context, I sit at the NIH in the Fogarty International Center, um, where our mandate is global health um, across diseases. So at the NIH and at Fogarty, we do believe that the health of women is not only a fundamental human right, but a cornerstone for global development. So when women thrive, so do their families, their communities, and their nations. Yet women and girls in LMICs face some of the most significant health challenges, ranging from infectious diseases to maternal health complications to gender-based violence. NIH and Fogarty have made it a priority to address these disparities through a comprehensive approach that emphasizes prevention, research, and global partnerships. So a um, here are a couple of key ways that we are working to transform women's health around the world. And I should do a shout out to our um, Office of Glo uh, Research on Women's Health, which is led by Janine Clayton, who spent their entirety of their time focused on this area. So one of the most effective ways to address women's health issues is by empowering local researchers. And this is really um, core to the Fogarty mission, which is building capacity. Through programs such as the Fogarty Health Program for Fellows and Scholars, we train and mentor scientists and LYCs to develop, implement um, preventive strategies tailored to the needs of their populations. These researchers are tack tackling issues like maternal mortality, pregnancy complication, and burden of infectious diseases, challenges that disproportionately affect women in low resource settings. Um, we also know that diseases like HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria continue to disproportionately impact women, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. Fogarty has been at the forefront of supporting research to prevent the spread of these diseases through women-centered approaches. For example, We've been working to expand access to HIV prevention, including mother to child transmission prevention and ensuring that women receive antiretroviral therapy. In, an, in LMICs where health infrastructure can be fragile, our research is focused on scalable interventions that can reach even the most remote communities. And then I'd just like to highlight that there are key emerging issues like climate change that we are um, working hard to tackle. Our research is increasingly recognizing the impact of climate on women's health. In many LMICs, women are the most vulnerable to environmental ch um, changes, including food insecurity, water scarcity, and displacement. Fogarty and the NIH are funding research that explores how these environment shifts affect women's health and how we can build resilience through preventive health measures. 
So overall, I just want to say that NIH and Fogarty are committed to continuing this important work. We believe that the research and partnerships, through research and partnerships, we can reduce the health disparities faced by women in low, middle-income countries, and we'll continue to prioritize this over time. Over. Great. Thank you. Um, let's start with you, Anurata. Would you like to share a little bit more about your insights and your call to action? Yeah, so good morning, everyone, and thank you, Nicole, for, for asking this uh, opening question, which I think is sort of also provokes us into sort of thinking hard about what is it that we, we want to prioritize. And uh, building on what Rachel said, one of the things that I think is very critical is to really focus a great deal of attention on preventing cervical cancer. Because I think this whole discussion is about what is it that we can easily prevent. And, and cervical cancer is a very uh, good example of how women should not be dying of a cancer that is almost completely uh, preventable. And it is really a tragedy that, that a woman dies of cervical cancer every 90 seconds. And, uh, and what is even more worrying is the fact that uh, cervical cancer cases and, and deaths are going up. And they're going up, especially uh, among younger women. So we are losing a lot of women uh, to cervical cancer when they're really in the prime of their youth. And Rachel highlighted uh, this issue of disparities, right? Uh, in, between rich countries and low and middle income countries. So we, we also sort of need to keep in mind that 95% of cervical cancer deaths actually are in low and middle income countries. So, so it's really a very glaring example of chronic and persistent health inequities and disparities. Uh, then, then another um, you know, thing is about HIV. So we have been paying a great deal of attention to infectious diseases, including HIV. But women living with HIV actually are at six times higher risk of developing cervical cancer. And in their case, it is no longer HIV. That is a death sentence. It is actually cervical cancer that, 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 that's going to kill them. So, and why we have an, a window of opportunity with cervical cancer? Because we know uh, that cervical cancer is caused by a virus, the human papilloma virus, which, which we can easily prevent with the use of a vaccine. So we have very safe, uh, highly effective vaccines. Uh, uh, they have been uh, sort of in use for the past 15 uh, years, but unfortunately the uptake of these vaccines uh, has been quite suboptimal. But with the vaccines, we also have secondary uh, prevention tools which is really screening. So the good news is that we have now, but we, we are moving from cytology-based screening actually to HPV DNA uh, screening methods, which allow women to uh, self-sample. So, so technologies are becoming better, easier to use. And with cervical cancer, uh, we have a special opportunity because cervical cancer takes 10 to 15 years uh, to develop. And it gives us adequate notice and adequate adequate time to actually screen. And once women are screened and we are able to detect pre-cancer -pre lesion, it is so easy to remove that with ablative methods. So my call will be to make sure that, that um, not to die of cervical cancer uh, is, is regarded as a fundamental uh, human right of every woman. And we bring all our might behind making sure that we promote uh, in integration of, of primary and secondary prevention. And, and that really means that it is on us to start to think differently and act very differently. And that is because you can't continue to operate in silos, just talk about vaccination, but not talk about screening or treatment of precancerous lesions. And that is why I'm so proud that we launched this Global HPV Consortium exactly a year ago. And it's a, it's a transdisciplinary collaborative where we are bringing all actors across uh, the ecosystem, whether it's agencies working in HIV space or reproductive health or vaccination, women empowerment, youth groups, et cetera, et cetera, so that they all come together and join hands so that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Very nice. Aisha, would you like to share your thoughts and what your call to action would be? 
Sure. Good morning, everyone. You know, at its most simple form, my call to action is to talk with us, not about us. Right. And what I mean by that, you know, and I was so excited to hear some of the questions that came up earlier because it really is the centering of women, but not just for the sake of having a woman at the table or in the seat or in leadership, but to understand the lived experiences of women. Because I think that is the distinction when we're talking about prevention. Disease prevention is always coupled with health promotion. Oftentimes we start talking about disease prevention and we forget about health promotion. But understanding health from a woman's context, from a woman's perspective, is an understanding that we are not a monolith. We may share some chromosomal similarities, but then you're only talking about the biological similarities. We have to talk about the psychological, the social, the spiritual, and the cultural differences and distinctions on how women live life across the globe. And it's not until we welcome those stories and the understanding of how women experience access to healthcare, how we experience hearing new diagnoses, how we experience navigating all these different care sectors in order to provide the care that's necessary for ourselves, but more importantly, that allows us to take care of our families. So until we can begin to have the conversation in the context of a woman's experience, we won't make any strides in this call to action or all of these goals that we're seeking to achieve, not only here today, but as we move forward across the country and across the world. Very nice, thank you. Okay, well, the, you know, we have some great call to actions here, but let's, let's talk about, we're gonna talk a little bit about barriers again, and then we'll get some more solutions going. So I'm gonna kick it back off to you, Aisha. Um, you know, and you, you've done a lot of different things across the board, from maternal health to emergency care to community, building the sense of community, following up on what you just said. And, you know, what, what upstream drivers are you dealing with when, a, when you're going to implement programs with the community workplace and whole, whole person needs? And that's a great question. And it really builds off of what I was just talking about. You know, understanding someone's lived experiences ties into social determinants of health which I'm sure many of you are familiar with or have at the very least heard the phrase. And so what we understand and have come to know and believe is that the social determinants are such a strong factor in really determining a person's outcome once they experience some type of disability, condition, disease, or otherwise. So it's important to understand things like being housed or unhoused. How important is that, right? It's important to understand access to transportation. Because if I need to access health services, for example, but I need to see a provider who is 20 minutes in one direction and then have follow up an hour in the other direction at the same time that I'm trying to hold down a position, the chances of me continuing and completing that care as designed are slim to none. We experienced the conversation earlier from Dr. Chang and understanding, you know, as a woman navigating all of the competing priorities, oftentimes we place our own needs secondary or maybe even tertiary behind others. And so it's important to understand barriers such as the transportation, the housing. It's also important to understand barriers that come into play from socioeconomic status, right? We still live in a world, and especially in this country, where there is a tremendous gap in the income level that is available for women as it relates to men. So we're talking 84 cents on the dollar, right? And interestingly enough, we talk about education as a social determinant. However, that gap, that wage gap, actually increases with the more education. It's almost an oxymoron, huh? You think you're going to get more education so that you can have more income and be able to take care of yourself and your family, where you find that you're actually more challenged with the more education that you achieve. So we really have to understand and address some of these, again, upstream meaning these are the causes. We're not simply treating the symptoms or what we see at face value, but we're actually peeling back the layer and peeling back the onion to determine how did we get here? And we have to shift our focus to addressing those challenges and not simply what we see on the back end, which are women who are delaying seeking care or delaying following up on treatment recommendations completely. Well, let's, let's follow up with Rachel on this too, because you deal a lot with SDOH, socioeconomic factors, cultural norms. Um, what have you seen the impact in preventive care in the work that you're doing from implement science globally?
I think. Hold on. Technical difficulty. We That's can, my um... bad. I was on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's only been a bunch of years, but okay. Um, so it's a good question. I think socioeconomic factors, cultural norms, and healthcare infrastructure are deeply intertwined, right, in shaping the success of preventive care globally. In implementation science, we recognize that a one-size-fits-all approach is not effective. So um, socioeconomic factors like income inequality or educational levels and employment influence access to prevention, um, to preventive care. So communities facing economic hardship are often pri often prioritize immediate needs over long-term health, leading to a lower uptake of services like vaccinations or screenings. So tailored interventions such as subsidies or mobile health units can help bridge these gaps. Um, cultural norms also play a critical role in some regions. Traditional beliefs about health or mistrust of modern medicine, which we saw in the pandemic, can hinder preventive measures. Um, and finally, health healthcare infrastructure sets the stage for preventive care effort. Weak systems, which sometimes you see in a low-income country, um, like lack of trained personnel or supply chain issues, can derail even well-designed programs. So, global imp implementation science focuses on creating scalable, sustainable models that take into account key drivers in the context of each um, setting by strengthening these infrastructures. Um, and this involves capacity building, leveraging digital health and fostering partnerships between local and international organizations um, over. Great, great. I think we'll have questions at the end unless you'd like to ask. Okay, thank you. Um, so keep going on this, this, this um, experience, um, past experience, Anurada. Um, you know, you have this wonderful wealth of a background in, in as a women's health advocate and leader. Um, could you give some um, examples of different challenges that women face pursuing that healthy life? Many examples. Uh, you know, one is that um, uh, maternal uh, mortality or maternal deaths. And, and we know that uh, uh, reducing maternal uh, mortality was a very big goal under the MDGs. And, and yet, you know, we saw suboptimal uh, progress. And now for the past uh, some years, you know, it's almost completely stalled uh, and we aren't moving forward. And I really feel that maternal deaths are a very stark and grim reminder of, of uh, sort of inadequate attention paid to you know, women, their health, you know, their, their, their well-being. Uh, and what really intrigues me is the fact that uh, when a woman gets pregnant, she gives, you know, her family and her society nine months notice. <laughs> you know, and she is bringing a new life into this world. It is, it is really such a natural act, and a woman should not be dying, bringing a new life into the world when everybody has been put on notice more than nine months. And yet we are losing women because of a childbirth related complications. So I really think that's, that's, that's just a surrogate indicator of what is wrong with health systems and also, uh, also the insensitivity that, that you see across healthcare you know, towards women. Another very you know, sort of, a, a, uh, another important thing is menstrual hygiene. I really think that when we are talking about prevention and what is possible, I think menstrual hygiene again stands out as, as a very good example. Because here, you know, sit in the West, uh, you, we take it as, a, as an entitlement. We don't even think about it twice, right? But, but I, were in, during my work, with low and middle income countries, I've seen how girls struggle on a daily basis to access sanitary napkins. You know, the kind of materials, including ash, that they have to use during their menstruation, which creates so many adverse 
health, health outcomes uh, for, for girls as, as, as they grow up. So I really think looking at, and women holistically, as you said, but also from menarche to menopause, you know, so it's really menarche and, and then menopause and, and a host of challenges, and then saying, okay, how can we intervene in order to sort of uh, provide better care for the, and preventive care? Uh, for women. Anemia is another very big public health challenge. You know, in, in my home country, India, uh, more than 65% of adolescent girls suffer from anemia. And that actually is then linked to adverse uh, met, uh, maternal uh, health outcomes and several other problems because, you know, women very rapidly get into severe an anemia conditions. And the last thing I would say is gender discrimination. So this came up, right, in uh, both Alicia and Rachel raised this, but in some of the you know, societies in low middle income countries and also here, you know, in, in some yeah. uh, uh, sort of uh, subpopulations, you would see gender discrimination really at, at, at play. And one of the, you know, very striking examples that I would want to share with you is the example of the last uh, uh, polio, uh, polio victim in India. So India you know, sort of eliminated polio in, in 2011. That was the last case that we had. And this was a girl called Ruksar, right? And she hadn't been vaccinated against polio, though her brother had been vaccinated. So, so there you can see how within households, you know, women and girl children suffer from so much of discrimination that, that you know, they don't have access to preventive tools like vaccination. You know, they don't have access to food and nutrition because, you know, there is a very strong preference for a male child. And, you know, if food is in short supply, then you know, food, a larger portion goes to, goes to you know, male children. So I, I think they, they, there are hosts of things which um, uh, need to be uh, sort of acknowledged as, as sort of things that can be easily fixed if they really receive due attention. Because any, it is very easy for us to fix anemia. It is easy for us to really pay greater attention to menstrual hygiene needs of, of, of girls. It is also, easy for us to start to uh, highlight and address gender parity issues across uh, preventive strategies such as vaccination. Great. Okay, so let's talk solutions, strategies to, to implement some more solutions. You, you were talking about, we, we've kind of touched on that along the way, but um, let's talk about uh, technology and innovation. Um, so, Rachel, what you know, how are you using technology and innovation to improve access to preventive services across the, the programs that you're working with today? Thanks very much. Um, so obviously technology and innovation can play a transformative role. Um, digital health tools such as mobile apps or telemedicine or AI driven platforms can help bridge the healthcare access gap, which I think is huge by delivering services directly to underserved populations. Um, M health platforms have already been shown to promise in providing real time health information, things like vaccination reminders and remote consultations, even in areas with limited infrastructure. So additionally, innovations like portable diagnostic devices and AI-powered decision support systems can en enable early detection and prompt intervention, um, reducing the burden of preventable diseases. So Fogarty has been involved in this through our M Health program, um, and we've been a leader in supporting research and capacity building initiatives in low and middle income countries in, um, related to digital health. Fogarty is develop, uh, focused on a developing health technology, technology solutions tailored to local contexts, such as building mobile health interventions for HIV pre prevention and maternal health. Their tra um, our training programs equip researchers and healthcare workers um, in low and middle income countries with the skills to implement and scale innovative health technologies. But there's a lot out there that we're still um, studying and there are big questions, but for sure it helps to level the playing field and provide access across um, uh, gender for sure and other disparate um, 
populations. Over. And we have so much access to to technology today. It, it'd be nice to have it in a more concerted effort um, to create that mm -hmm. access. Um, let's let's talk about solutions in cervical cancer. You you touched on this, Anurada. Um, it's one of the most preventable cancers, and you talked about screening and and the vaccinations. But how do you get through the what's the cancer prevention barriers that women face that 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 cause a breakdown of that? And, and what what solutions could we work on to to help um, get access to that for women? So I think there are uh, you know, several reasons why we haven't seen. Uh, optimal uptake of the fantastic preventive tools that we have uh, to, to uh, stop cervical cancer. I think one is just uh, the issue of attention. You know, the, the, there has been a lot of attention focused on uh, improving maternal survival, but, but uh, this has also meant that several other women health issues have actually been put on the back burner or they never received that, that, that or due attention. So I think that's, that's just the context. But now I think increasingly we are talking about the non-communicable diseases the, and, and also the kind of uh, morbidity and mortality uh, that are caused by non-communicable diseases. Because I think the MDG era was really more about infectious diseases and, and uh, there was a lot of focus on that apart from maternal and child survival. But uh, now, you know, we, we have started to recognize, albeit a bit late, you know, the, the whole challenge posed by non-communicable diseases. So cervical cancer actually sits on the intersection of infectious because it's a virus that gets transmitted and that causes the disease, but the manifestation is a cancer, which is a non-communicable disease. So I do think that now we have started to talk about it in a way that, that we haven't had this discourse uh, previously. But the sec what are really some of the barriers that we are seeing? I think one really is the barrier around vaccination. Because as I said, a vac vaccination has been uh, sort of uh, on for the past 15 years. So even in the US, the uptake of HPV vaccination is only about 61%. But, but there are you know, countries that account for about half of uh, cervical cancer cases globally. Uh, have not introduced the HPV vaccination. So, you know, so there are a lot of countries that are still to use, uh, are still to introduce or roll out HPV vaccination, which is publicly funded. But uh, there is also, but in many countries where the vaccine has been rolled out, uh, we, we are seeing uh, persistent challenges uh, with achieving and sustaining high coverage of vaccination. And that is because in some of the poorer settings, you know, getting to this age group, you know, because you're looking at nine to 14 years of age group, that is challenging because in most of the low and middle income countries, the vaccination has been very focused on childhood vaccination, right? In, and really infant vaccination. So when you're looking at this new group, then the girls are in schools and, and most of the countries do not have the, the wherewithal or infrastructure to actually get to girls uh, in, and, and vaccinate them in, in schools. But then also the challenge is exacerbated by the fact that in many of these countries, a lot of girls uh, a drop out of school at this age. So, you know, so there are countries where 50% of eligible girls are in schools, but almost 50% of girls are out of school. So I think this, this therefore requires a very different kind of delivery modality, which I think hasn't been, hasn't been cracked uh, so far. Then the next uh, thing I, I also think is the issue of financing. So I think financing uh, to me has been the biggest elephant in, in, in the room in, during all these conversations, because we know that we have these wonderful tools right that that we can be uh, that can be used but there isn't just enough financing so when we talk about vaccination of course gavi is there as the big global fund i was there you know and we incorporated hpv into gavi portfolio but gavi supports only 53 countries now so there are 80 self financing okay. middle income countries where they are not getting support externally and and given all the fiscal constraints particularly in the wake of covid-19 pandemic 
I think countries are just struggling on financing front. And then we come to screening, right? And screening, of course, has no global financing mechanism, right? So, so con and, and, and uh, you know, the costs are high. So I think financing and so first of all, mobilizing political will, you know, making this a very important agenda, you know, in, uh, for, for the political executive, and then, and we have had some very encouraging, actually, developments. Like you might have read about the Quad uh, ca Cancer Moonshot, um, and and also uh, their commitment to prioritize cervical cancer as the first cancer. So there are interesting and very encouraging things that have started to happen. But overall, I think financing has been an issue. And the last thing I would say is that when we are designing all these programs, I think we are. Uh, not paying adequate attention to listening to communities. And I think it's very important that we go out into, uh, into communities, pay attention to social behavioral uh, dimensions uh, of, of uh, many of these uh, programs, uh, really uh, sort of try to understand what the communities want, what resonates with them, what kind of delivery strategies would they prefer, and then try and design our, our interventions accordingly. Great. Um, you bring up a great point about reaching the community. Because I'm gonna, I'm gonna push this to Aisha. Um, you get to finish this off, and then we'll open up questions to the audience. But um, what, what programs or what solutions do you feel like could really help open this up? This whole, whole person care for women. You know, you talked about spiritual. You talked about. Um, financial, you talked about all the different aspects of our health and wellness. Um, what, what, what do you see on the horizon? Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because I echo exactly a lot of the same things that Anurata has shared. <clears throat> so a whole person approach takes a whole community. None of us can do this work alone. And again, as we mentioned, there are resources, including those that are financial, that many of us are limited in. However, establishing and maintaining partnerships is always going to be the first step in addressing this problem. But more specifically, when we talk about strategies, there's different levels to this, as my daughter would say, right? Mm -hmm. So there's the policy conversation, and that's the big P policy that really has the teeth behind what we're trying to do. So policies that level the playing field and improve access for everyone, right? So things like removing or reducing costs associated with preventive screenings. What does that look like? How do we build that to ensure that women have equal access and especially to those screenings that are specific to women? So things like the establishment of clinical practice guidelines, prevention guidelines that are tailored to and informed by the women's experience and making sure that those costs are actually addressed and included in those that are covered. There's also policy options such as employer-based, right? We all know the challenges that women face related to childcare, and that's not just the K through 12, right? So we have many, many issues where women are providing care, and in this country, in the United States, 81% of unpaid caregivers are women. So if we understand how this impacts us, and then we also equate that with the paid caregivers and the women-dominant professions such as nursing and teaching, we understand the implications of losing a day at work and what that cost is into our society. So from a policy perspective, we have to understand those nuances. From an organizational level, we have to stop being afraid to care. And I think that that's an important piece, if I could leave with everyone here, is never be afraid to care. Because caring is what's missing in a lot of our approaches to not only disease prevention, but health promotion. And what caring means is actually hearing a person and taking what they have to say into the context of what we build and what we design, and not stopping there, but coming back to assess whether or not it's actually worked and is working for the population that we're intending to serve. And from a personal and a more person-specific focus, it's the opportunity to coordinate care delivery services and not leave it up to an individual, up to a woman, to know and understand what's going on with our own bodies. Just because I am a woman does not mean that I understand the symptoms that I felt this morning, right? Or the symptoms that I will feel tomorrow night. We have to understand that women also require the education at the community and the individual level in order to make sure that we have the information and can make informed decisions about our own health. And lastly, what I'll say is that it's important again to not only have us at the table, but invite us to speak. And once we do speak, to make sure that, we're, that you're listening.
Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well with that, I, I'd like to open it up for a few questions from the audience and then we'll go we'll break for a break. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, I run a, an international uh, humanitarian organization in Latin America, and we provide last mile health care. Uh, we're serving nearly a million people and most of them are women as are most of our health workers. We do have a low cost uh, screening for HPV, yay. Um, and it's been very effective. We are having a hard time getting access to vaccines. They're expensive, infrastructure is virtually non-existent. Most of the people we serve have maybe a fourth or fifth grade level education. Um, we have a hard time getting birth control out to them, so I'm very interested in that. I've been, I'm the founder and I've been doing this for 20 years and we're running into all kinds of, all kinds of issues. Number one, financing, thank you for bringing that up. It seems like a lot of funders, I call them disease of the month funders. I hate to call it that because they are doing good work. The research suggests that holistic community health workers, and we elect our health workers in the communities, really work and provide care across all kinds of areas and include vaccinations, um, parteros, uh, childbirthing, and all those kinds of things. But because we're holistic, a lot of funding sources are not available to us, even though we cover all those things that they're interested in. Um, I'm a former aerospace consultant, so I'm very big on data collection. We have the data. Um, as each uh, funding cycle goes through, there's a new interest. And I was so excited when it was DEI because um, I come from a multiracial family and I'm Latina myself, but then I was told that I'm too old to run my own org. Um, I hiked to Annapurna Base Camp three years ago, over 5,000 meters. I am not too old to be doing what I'm doing, but what can we do about access to funding even when we're doing everything right and the research out there we love because it suggests that we're doing right. How do we get access to those more expensive tools? Thank you. We'll, we'll make it quick because we, we do have to. Any, you want to take it? Or? Yeah, I can. You know, I think it's more of a comment, right? It's, uh, and it's, uh, it just uh, goes to show how unfortunate the situation is on the ground. And I did allude to this in my call to action, saying we really need to start to think and act very differently because uh, health, unfortunately, is so fractured and so siloed. And unless we dismantle and tear down those walls and those silos, I think we are not going to see any remarkable progress on the goals that have already been set. So you said that. So that is why, you know, the Global HPV Consortium that, that we are spearheading actually lays a lot of emphasis on tearing down those silos and, you know, bringing people together to have that conversation so that we can drive the synergies that are required between vaccination and screening. Because you can do screening, but if you don't bring vaccines into this, that is not a, a holistic strategy. And I also think unless you are offering a very wholesome, holistic, complete solution to communities, communities start to lose faith in you. Because, you know, today, as you said, donor of the month or disease of the month, you know, so you have money, you go and you talk about vaccination, but you also talk about vaccination for just one disease. It's either polio or it is measles or at some other point of time, it's some something else that erupts like monkeypox or, or whatever, yellow fever. or So I do think that I, I completely agree with you. And that's something that we are trying to sort of advocate for and say that without that integration and that synergy and, and looking at the whole thing from community perspective, we won't be able to make any, any, any headway. Great, thank you. Would you like, yes, yes. 
Sure. So uh, this is a question to Rachel. Um, it's not only UN General Assembly Week, but it's also Climate Week here in New York City. And 80% of women, 80% uh, oh, of displaced climate refugees are women. Um, and I'm curious, since I know and I, at Fogarty, is interested in climate and health. Are you looking at the nexus of women and climate as long as we're talking about prevention? Because we know that extreme weather um, impacts women disproportionately as well. Thank you for that question. Um, it's a great question. And in, in a way, yes, and in a way, no. But I, we are doing work around climate and its impact on um, human health and on and really looking at the research agenda that that's situated there. We have a project that's focused on um, research in humanitarian settings within the Center for Global Health Studies at Fogarty. Um, and I think women fall into the um, most impacted groups. And so we are looking at research across many different areas and um, certainly the impact on women disproportionately um, is, is part of the agenda. Um, there is not a specific initiative that's focused on gender and climate yet, but I think we are, you know, we're moving into a broad space and I think there will be more focused efforts um, following. So uh, before, before uh, we break, a uh, very quick thing. So two things. First of all, um, it's a rich conversation that you're already having, and there are lots of questions that we don't have time for. So Dr. Chang has very kindly agreed that if you, if you have a pressing question you want answered uh, and you don't get to, uh, to actually talk to her herself, if you see one of uh, any of the staff who are here, um, we'll take the question. Uh, she'll answer in writing and we'll publish that. And I'd like to think that all of the other speakers will do the same. Okay, so that actually we give you the chance to be able to ask those things. And then the next thing I'm gonna do very quickly is to read out um, one of the questions from online so that they don't feel totally excluded. So Rachel, this is a question for you. So it says the disparities exist in high income countries as well. We have a whole person uh, view solution. Our company is founded and run by women. Our solution has taken into account how women have to manage their health, their dependencies, uh, health, and often uh, their parents' health. But with women getting only 1.7% of the funding, how do we bring solutions in front of people who can make the decisions on funding and the usage of these tools? It's a good question and a big question. I think um, for NIH, I think we um, as funders are, so Fogarty is focused on um, global health broadly um, across many different disease areas, but we collaborate closely with the Office for Research on Women's Health, which is in the Office of the Director at NIH, um, and their exclusive focus is on women um, and health issues. So. I think, um, I don't have a good answer, but I think that we are working to sort of collaborate um, to elevate that as a priority across many different programs and many different areas of focus. Great, well, thank you so much. I think we could keep talking about this, but everybody else has to talk too. So um, if you would love to talk to uh, our, our distinguished panelists that will be around for the break, but we will take a break right now. Irene, did you want to talk or we're good? Okay, so we get a 15 or a, a 12 minute, five minute break, sorry. sorry. Five minutes, sorry, but then we can keep back on track. Thanks so much. And thank you so much to our panelists.